song that we just sang. I just want to thank the Lord for all he's done in my life. I was taught the scriptures before I could read them. Found them to be true. That's why I Sometimes things don't go the way we thought they should go. And I know a lot of you have been praying for Caleb, and uh, it's been a hard time for him, and I appreciate all the prayer 
I know a lot of you go through physical ailments as well. But about a week ago, we had one particular doctor's appointment where it kind of hit me. If you've ever been in an appointment like that, I know a lot of you in here, you've struggled with cancer, you've battled other things mentally that you've been praying God take from you. And it was in that doctor's appointment with him where I lost hope. I'd kind of been able to hold on to some hope and, and, and been able to think that, man, things were going to get better. And, and it was in that particular doctor's appointment where I kind of just walked out and I just saw, I just thought, I don't see a lot of hope in this. But you know, the, the truth is this, is that God allows these years that as we walk with Him, He always is proven faithful. I mean, He always is. And so what, what He's facing right now, my son, and as He lays in bed at night, and He groans and He's in so much pain and his back is just the, the x-rays that we saw and, and just the way that his spine is shaped at this point he doesn't walk upright he's just in so much pain the doctors have just said listen you just need to do everything you can until we can get him to duke and, and just try to get it taken care of but listen to me what i love about god is that god's brought me through many other things and as he's brought me through those other things, those are just testimonies that as I'm going through what I'm going through right now, they just say God was faithful then. God's not going to change now. And Christian, whatever, whatever right now is, is overwhelming your life, whatever you're going through right now, the same God that brought you, brought you through the darkness and the, the low times and the valley, whatever you want to call it, the storm, is the same God that will pace you through that problem that you're having right now. God is faithful. God is faithful. Amen. Think about that as daily sin. In the mess of this old world, sometimes I need a word from heaven that everything's okay. I try to walk by faith but sometimes I'm so afraid And I cannot see how God can make a way But then I think He's never failed me Never left me Not one time if I cried out And my voice He has not heard Never failed today he will make a way he's never failed me as broken as you feel oh your troubles they are real and I know you think that God's forsaken you but child, don't lose your faith. He is working while you wait. So just hold on. He will bring you through. He's never failed me. Never let me.
the Lord. You can be seated. You ought to praise the Lord for a good youth choir like that singing in the church. It's a blessing. And man, I'm telling you, every time they sing that, I choose to be a Christian. I am blessed by the fact that I have children up there singing that song. I am blessed by the fact that by the grace of God, I've got children up there who can testify and say, I was taught the scriptures from before I could read them. What a blessing. If your children have been raised in the, in the things of God, that is wonderful. And we ought to be able to rejoice in that. And so I praise the Lord for getting to hear the youth choir sing tonight. Luke chapter 12. You know, sometimes we uh, are so familiar with the youth choir that we can miss really uh, the blessing that it is. And that's why when we go to these other places and sing, uh, they'll sing the same songs. And oftentimes, uh, Brother Jason will tell you, with much less of a choir than what stands up here. A lot fewer uh, than what's in here tonight. But they just go and they'll sing in these churches where they don't have a lot of young people. And the ones they do have don't always just have a heart to just rear back and sing for God and lift their hands. And I'm telling you, it just makes an impact in those churches because it's rare to them. And then it blesses their heart. When we went down to the uh, Greer camp meeting two years ago, that's one of the things that Brother Joe Arthur said. He said, this camp meeting has gotten old. It's it's a well attended, but the attendees are really a lot of older folks. And here's what he said. He said, Brother Tony, a lot of their churches don't have any young people in them. And he said, they think all the young people are living for the devil. And, uh, and he said, it's so wonderful for them to see. Now, when we went there, we took our whole camp, not just our choir. We had 200 from the teen camp to get up and sing. And he said, you wouldn't believe what life it just in, injected into a lot of them folks. It, it encouraged them that there's still a bunch of young people that love the Lord. And so we ought to, we got to ask the Lord to help us not get used to it so that we miss the blessing of our kids standing up and singing for the glory of God the way they do. So I appreciate the young people. And uh, you say, well, I know this. I saw one of them doing this and one of them doing that. And I understand. I understand. They don't know how to hide their stuff as good as you do. I get it. I get it. And they'll learn. Don't worry about it. They'll learn. And they'll be as good at faking as you are. <laughs> and... Uh, and then, and then it won't bother you. And so let's just don't be too critical. All right. Let's just realize that they are teenagers. They're going to make mistakes just like we do and did. But I believe the majority of them have a heart for God and we ought to thank God for that. And this day, if they've got a heart for God, we ought to be excited about it. Luke chapter 12. I apologize if that was too hateful for you right there. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if I need to apologize. So I'm going to risk it and say, yes, I do need to apologize. So Verse 13, we're going to read. Let me give you a couple of things. Hopefully you have signed up for the fasting. And if you've never done it, I would encourage you to participate. It's called spiritual growth. To do something spiritual you've never done before is called spiritual growth. It'll be good for us. And like Brother Matt said, you don't have to do 24 hours. If you've never done it and you're scared and you don't know, and I'm going to go ahead and warn you, your flesh is going to hate it. It just is. Our flesh is so wicked. 
Some of you can get busy at work and not even think about the fact that you didn't eat breakfast and you ain't even hungry until 12 or 1 or uh, 1.30. But I'm telling you, on the day you're fasting at 8 o'clock, you're going to be starved to death. Because your flesh is rebellious and wicked. It ought to show you something. It ought to show you the truth to what we're doing. And every time that hunger pain hits, you say, Oh God, bless the camp meeting. Oh God, bless the camp meeting. And the Lord will bless it, no doubt about it. So get in on that. And then uh, don't forget that we do need help in the nursery still, Miss Miranda. We need help serving and cleaning. And uh, you can talk to uh, Miss Krause about that. And Brother Steve, can you come see me right after the service? I need to ask you a question, Brother, if I could. And then uh, we'll jump into the message. Praise the Lord. Uh, I was uh, hurrying up to the piano right before the service. Miss Donna was coming up. I said, hold on, Miss Donna. I need to check something real quick. I need to jump up there and check something about a song. And uh, I stepped around there in a hurry and, and hit my ankle on the side of that wall right there. And as soon as I did, Miss Donna cussed. She cussed when I hit my ankle. I don't know how that happened. I guess she could feel that's what I was wanting to do, but uh, no, I wasn't wanting to curse, but I did about cry, didn't I, Miss Donna? I said, oh, 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 she's like, what? I said, I just broke my ankle on that wall because I was hurrying, and so I'm thankful that I'm standing here. I mean, a trooper. <laughs> Caleb thinks he's hurting. He ought to feel this ankle. I'm like the Fox's Book of Martyrs right now, standing on one leg, preaching, no, it's not bad at all now, but when it happened, how many of you know when those things happen, you think you're dead, right? You ladies are going, no, that's just you men. I get it, I get it, I understand. All right, Brother Jonathan, will you get these lights for me? We'll just show you a couple of pictures here in just a minute. Luke chapter 12, verse 13, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of the covetousness for a man of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Heavenly Father, would you help me now to preach with great power, and Lord, help our hearts to be open to the truths of your word and challenge us tonight that we might be better for you and for your glory and for the good of others this week. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say it. If you were in here this morning, and many of you were, I started a series on some places in the New Testament where we are warned to take heed, take heed. And very simply, it means be concerned enough to be careful. Uh, it means you've seen something here, and, it, and it's, uh, maybe it's not deadly to, the first, you know, to first sight, but it's enough that you need to be cautious, proceed with caution. It means to just uh, take it easy. I showed you a couple of uh, funny caution signs this morning. Let me give you a couple more in case some of you need to smile a minute. I've never seen this one. <laughs> but it would get my attention if I was driving, wouldn't it you? It's been a long-term dream of mine to see a bear fall off of a bluff while I'm driving down the road. Every time I drive through the gorge to go toward Knoxville, toward Kentucky, I always think this would be awesome just to see a bear roll down. I don't even know how that dream started in my heart, but it's real. <laughs> and so if I ever see a sign like that and it's a bear, I'm just stopping. I'm just staying till one falls down the hill. Give me that next one, Brother Tyler. Way to wait, by the way, Brother Tyler. Good job. Men at work. Women work all the time. They don't need to put up signs. Say amen, ladies, right there. Well, when we men work, we would like for somebody to notice it. If you could notice and pat us on the back, it would be a, a help to us. We'd probably do better. Give me the next one. Invincible moose for the next five kilometers. Look at that car. Have mercy, you don't want to hit a moose. Praise God. Give me the next one. Now, this is really not a caution one, but it's hilarious. Stress reduction. Bang your head here. here. It says place on a hard surface. And it, it says follow directions inside the circle. Repeat step two uh, until you're feeling better or unconscious. <laughs> uh, so I think sometimes I'd like to have that one. Give me this last one right here. Hunters, please use caution when hunting pedestrians using walk trails. <laughs> we might need some punctuation in this one. Hunters, please use caution when hunting, period. Pedestrians using walk trails. If the hunters are hunting pedestrians, you might want to walk somewhere else, all right? And that's, not a, that's a caution one, but uh, some of those are funny. But the truth is, those are just silly things. 
But here's the, the reality is the Word of God has given us a warning about some things that if they come creeping into our hearts and lives, we should get cautious. If we notice them or sense them, by the way, if you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, the Holy Spirit will sound the warning. The Holy Spirit, when those thoughts begin to arise in your life, when these habits begin to form, the Holy Spirit will sound the warning. He will say, take heed, take heed. The Holy Spirit will will bring that to your heart. We have to then pay attention to the warning and, and be careful. In the first message today, I showed you how the Holy Spirit cautioned us about being overconfident. I on purpose didn't use pride. There's some more of these take heeds that involve pride. The verse was, him that thinketh he standeth. There's certainly a level of pride in that. But sometimes it's just deception by your own deceitful heart. Sometimes it's just the devil coming along and saying, oh, don't you worry about it. He's not talking about you. You've been saved too long to worry about that. You've been in church too long to worry about that. You know too much Bible to worry about that. And the Bible says when you start having those feelings, you better take heed. You better slow down. You better pump the brakes. Pull back on the reins and just begin to be cautious. And the Bible said this morning at the end, lest he fall. And then I showed you how out of Proverbs, Solomon warned us about that haughty spirit. And the haughty spirit is more than just thinking well of yourself. It's thinking well of yourself with disdain towards somebody else. And so that idea is looking at somebody else's mistake and thinking, I could never do that. That's the haughty spirit. Oh, look at them. Can you believe they did that or they said that or they acted like this? And by the way, that's that's one of the dangers of this social media. We get to see inside of people's hearts and minds a lot more than we ever have before. And by the way, when you start seeing inside of all of our hearts and minds, it's not pretty usually. So be careful about when you read some of that being very judgmental, like, I cannot believe they, I cannot believe, I would never. Uh, The Bible says take heed when that stuff starts coming into your heart. And that was this morning. Be careful of overconfidence. Now tonight I want to look at another caution. Now this one offered by the Lord himself. And so in these verses we read here in Luke 12, 13 and 15, notice first of all the debate in verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And so this man comes to the Lord and he has a financial dispute with his brother. It's very likely, if you know some of the Old Testament law, the older brother was given more of the inheritance. He was given a double portion and he was given some other responsibilities. And it's very likely that what you have here is one of the other siblings saying, hey, that's not right. He shouldn't do that. We ought to divide it evenly. And so he's now brought this, uh, you know, his disgruntled spirit to the Lord. And he's arguing about money. He's upset about finances. He's upset about feeling like he did not get what he deserved. He deserves some greater portion just like his brother got. And so the debate here is this financial debate between brothers. Money can destroy relationships. Well, you got to be careful. Now listen, it doesn't say that money itself is wicked. But boy, when you begin to love it, it's the root of all evil. And it can destroy, listen, many, many, many homes have been destroyed over money problems, fighting over money. Many friendships have been destroyed over money. Many uh, partners who have been successful and done great together and then this issue come in between them and busted up great businesses and such. And so we see yet again here a family fighting over money, the debate. In verse 14, I want you to see the displeasure The Lord doesn't like the question. He certainly doesn't like that he has asked him to help settle this in verse 14. And he, the Lord, said unto him, the man, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? In other words, he said, why are you asking me that? Y'all settle that. The Lord said, "I'm I'm not getting in that. Why would you bring that to me? You know, I wonder sometimes if the Lord gets frustrated with some of the stuff we bring him. Now, I don't believe anything's too small for the Lord. I don't believe that. In other words, I don't believe anything that you are burdened about is too little of a deal to bring to God like He wouldn't want you to bring it because it's too small. Well, one song says, if it matters to you, then it matters to the Master. I like that song. 
And that's true. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And it doesn't matter if everybody else thinks it's no big deal. If it's weighing heavy on me, then it's a big deal to God. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about you shouldn't bring those little things to God. We ought to bring all of our burdens to the Lord. But what I am saying is I wonder if sometimes, I just wonder if sometimes, because what is bothering us is based maybe on some sinful mentality or some spiritually immature mentality. I wonder if sometimes when I bring those things to Him, I mean, something in all reality I shouldn't even be upset about, but because of my spiritual immaturity, I am, and I bring it to God. God, did you hear what she said to me? God, did you see what they did to me? Lord, can you believe? And you bring these things, and and sometimes I wonder if we might frustrate Him a little with the pettiness of some of the problems we bring. That's what it appears is going on here. And the Bible does say this. It says, uh, you have not because you ask not. Certainly you're not going to get any answers if you don't ask. But the next verse says this. You ask and you, have, and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Now lust there is not talking about sensual things. It's talking about just what you want. In other words, he says, sometimes you don't get your prayers answered because you don't ask them. He says, but other times I just refuse to answer them because you're asking a foolish thing. You're asking a lustful thing, a selfish, a a, a prideful thing, if you will. Something that's just to feed your what you want. And so we got to be careful about that. We see the displeasure of the Lord here with the question that was brought to him by this man. So the debate is a fight over money between he and his brother, the displeasure of the Lord. He says, "Why why would you ask me that? And then that gets us to verse 15, the declaration. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So here we see the Lord offer the simple word of caution again. Take heed. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. In the declaration, I see an intensity. See what you mean? Well, look at it. He doesn't just say take heed this time. He says take heed and what? What does he add to it? Beware. Now, you know what beware means? Beware is almost the same thing as take heed. Beware just simply means to restrain or guard oneself from something. So be careful. Beware. Uh, Beware of dog means, hey, you better be cautious as you walk in my yard. My dog's going to bite your leg off, you know. I always appreciate out soul winning and doing different things when the dog just acts like if it could get around that fence, it would eat me. And they're saying, it won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. I can see another man's bone sticking out of its mouth. I'm thinking, you are a liar. Now, I will say we were knocking doors last year on growth visitation, and a woman was completely honest. This dog come out about halfway out the yard, and he was going pretty wild. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to say, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, trying to do, you know, I'm the dog whisperer, going to calm it down. I have my wife, different ones were there with us knocking doors. And I'm walking up that yard real carefully trying to talk to it. And the lady steps out on the porch and says, he will bite you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I said, we're just out from the church. Come see us. I turned and left. Because she didn't call him back. She wasn't saying, oh, he'll bite you. Hold on, let me get him. No. She wasn't saying, he'll bite you. Come here, come here. No, she was saying, he'll bite you. Which meant, I'm going to let him if you keep walking up this yard. And so I just felt the Holy Spirit lead me to a different house. (laughs) Amen. I already about tore my ankle off. I can't get my leg bit off. And I mean... A martyr can only take so much, praise the Lord. Notice the Lord says here, take heed and beware. And so it's almost as if he says the same thing twice. It's, a, it's an extra level of intensity. He didn't just say take heed, he said, hey, hey, take heed, hey, beware. He's like, he's making sure. It's when you're talking to your children and you can tell they're not listening to you. So, hey, look, you grab their face and point, are you focused on me? Miss Styles don't grab my face, but she regularly will say, I need you to focus. I don't have any idea why she would feel the need to say that to me. I'm such a singularly focused individual all the time. But you have to grab your child and say, hey, hey. That's like the Lord is doing that here. He's saying, take heed and, hey, beware. He said it twice. There's an intensity here. So what he's about to tell us, he's serious about. He's very intense about. It's very important in the heart of the Lord. So then we look at not only the intensity in the declaration, notice the issue. What is he so, what is he so passionate about? Take heed and beware of covetousness. 
The word covet, now listen, simply means to desire or wish for. That's what the word covet means all by itself. And we understand that to simply wish for something in and of itself isn't necessarily wickedness or dangerous. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says for us to covet earnestly the best gifts. He that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good thing. So it's not a sin to necessarily to to desire something or to wish for something uh, just by itself. But coveting can certainly very easily turn into a problem. And I'm going to give you three ways that it can do that. And I'm going to focus on, on just one of them. One way is when what we are coveting is wicked in itself. If you're coveting wickedness, then this is the real problem. Take heed of that. If what you are desiring is wicked and can hurt you and destroy you and all that, then now the Lord would say take heed to that. Be careful about what your desires are. Secondly, coveting can be a problem when we are coveting jealously Something God has given to somebody else. That's what it's like in the Old Testament when he keeps saying, Thou shalt not covet. He almost always adds, Thy neighbor's something. So now, it's not necessarily sinful to just, you know, I I, I wish maybe one of these days we could have this, or maybe if the Lord would bless us, we could have a nice or that or whatever. That's not a sin in and of itself. But if what you're coveting is wicked, then it's a problem and it's a sin. Or if what's happened now is you've seen that God has done this for somebody else, and you wish he was doing it for you instead of them. Now now you've crossed into a, a, a sinful situation of coveting. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's, it just goes on and on. And so when we are jealously, envy, envy is a terrible sin. You got to be careful. Well, how come, how come their kid got to do this and not my kid? Well, you better be careful about envy. Envy will destroy you. Terrible sin. The Lord says, take heed about that. Take heed if you are coveting the wrong things. Take heed if you're jealously coveting some things God's done for somebody else in their life. And then the third way it becomes a problem is when we simply desire, listen to me, I want you to focus, is when we simply desire more and more and more all the time, regardless of what we have. We would call this discontent or unsatisfied. There's nothing wrong with wishing for some better things. Uh, most of us that are my age and older didn't grow up with very much. And so as we became adults and we started to have children, we wanted more for our children than we have. How many of you have had those thoughts? Shake your head. You wanted your children to have it a little easier, a little better. You wanted to be able to do more for them than maybe was able to do for you. And I don't think necessarily that's a sin in and of itself to wish those things. But here's here's where it becomes a problem. Here's where you better proceed with caution. When despite God's blessings over and over in your life, it never seems to be enough. There never seems to be a spirit of contentment inside of you. It doesn't matter what you get. It just seems like you got to have something else. Your eye immediately, hey, no matter how long you looked at this, once you get it, your eye immediately begins to look at something else. Now, the Lord says, you better take heed to that, because that is deadly. That's the one I want to focus on in just a few minutes, because I believe it is the most subtle of the three. I mean, come on, we know we're not supposed to covet wickedness. I'm not saying that keeps us from doing it always, but it's not like it's sneaky. You know that that's wrong if you're coveting wicked things. And we know that it's not right to be envious or jealous of the blessings of God on somebody else and and wishing that it had happened to me instead of them. We understand envy and jealousy is quite frowned upon in the Bible. We get that. But it's this one that's more subtle that I believe kind of sneaks in on us. And that's where we need to take heed. It sneaks in on us and without even knowing, we just buy into this this discontentment with my life. This unsatisfied spirit. This, it's never enough and i got to try again and try again. And we got to be careful because, listen, I'm telling you, it is deadly dangerous, this is. That's why the Lord would say, take heed, beware. It's deadly dangerous on a Christian home. Many, many homes have been busted up because somebody just couldn't get satisfied with what God had given them. 
just always looking out there. Always just not, it's, I mean, we change this, change that, change this, but it's never, it's always just still something missing. You know what you better do? You better take heed to that. More than one home. Many homes, many folks are never content. You know what it does? It creates constant stress in their life. It creates constant confusion. It's just everything's got to be always searching, always turning over the next stone and changing this and changing that. And there's no stability because I am not satisfied. And don't I deserve to be happy? And you know, no. (laughs) No, not if you look at it from heaven. If you look at it from heaven, we deserve to burn in hell. Now, if we look at it comparingly to everybody else, yes, you deserve happiness as much as anybody else. But the truth is, we've got to be careful about that mentality. Because if it's not reaching what I consider should make me happy, then all of a sudden now I'm discontent, which means I'm disappointed with how God is working my life thing out here. It's as if God is not being fair to me creates a discontentment. It is a deadly, deadly dangerous thing. So the Lord says, He says, take heed. You've seen them. They continually change jobs. Now, I'm not against striving for more and climbing the ladder and all that, but that's not what we're talking about. You know them. It's continually. And every time when they talk to you about it, it's because this is going to be the one that's going to give me these couple of little perks that's going to finally make everything. It's going to make everything all right. Have you noticed that it never does? And here's what happens. After they get the new one, they tell you, oh, well, they lied. It's not what they said it was. Well, and I get that that happens to us. But listen, maybe you better look inside. Maybe there's a take heed for you that it wouldn't matter what the job was. And so they're always changing things. They need a new car. They need a new house. They need a new best friend. Uh, They need a new challenge. They need a new hobby. They need a new... And look, I get it. As we get older, things change. We're going to like different stuff. I praise the Lord for all of that. But I'm just telling you, you need to at least proceed with caution if you have this kind of spirit. Take heed, he said. I didn't write it. The Holy Spirit said, hey, beware of covetousness. Beware if you're wanting wicked things. Beware if you're always wanting what everybody else has got because you feel like they got more and better than you. And beware if what you do have is never enough. Beware of that one. See, they're changing all of that because they are counting on the next one to be the one that will finally do it. The next whatever is going to be the one that finally satisfies. But it don't. So the Lord explains at the end of this verse that things are not what brings contentment. Contentment is something that God can give us. But listen to me. According to the Word of God, it's also something we can and must learn. Learn. You know, typically you have to try to learn something. you got to study to learn something sometimes. And contentment is something we have to work to learn. The Apostle Paul said it. He said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul didn't say, man, as soon as I got saved, it fixed my whole contentment problem. He didn't say that. He said, no, after I got saved, I had to learn how to be content. Because Paul had it rough in his life. Paul had to get to the place that it's okay that I'm being beat. It's okay that I'm shipwrecked. It's okay that I'm over here in jail. Paul had to get to the place that he could be content in whatsoever state he was in. He had to learn it. Later we see this. Boy, listen to this. Did he learn it? Paul went ahead and narrowed it down. Paul decided this is all I need for contentment. Here's what he said to Timothy. He said, in having food and raiment, let us be there with content. How about that? He didn't even say a house. He didn't say a nice chariot or really fast camel. I would have said, how about a nice camel? You know, nice rims on my camel and all that stuff. Paul got himself to the place. He said, if I have food and clothes, I'm good. Now, I'm not saying we have to all get there. But as we read this morning, these things are for our example. 
You say, was Paul always like that? It doesn't sound like it. Sounds like, and by the way, before he got saved, it, it seems that he probably had some money. He was working for the, the big shots, you know, for the Sanhedrin. He probably was doing pretty well. So when he turned on them and started following Christ, they took all that away. Next thing you know, he's got nothing. And so Paul had to learn, listen to me now, he had to learn that as long as I got food and clothes, I can be content. And listen, most of us in here have so much more than, than just enough food and just enough clothes. As a matter of fact, most of us have this problem. We have so much food, our clothes don't fit. <laughs> right? That's most of us. I got a ton of clothes that I cannot wear because I got too much food. Praise God. So why are we not content? It's a, it's a danger. And so the declaration here has the intensity and then it has the issue. In Hebrews, it simply says this, let your conversation be without covetous and be content with such things as you have. You know what that verse makes it sound like? That verse makes it sound like it's just a decision. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Quit talking like that. Quit talking about what you don't have. Quit talking about how everybody's got it better than you. Just decide you're not going to talk like that. Sound like a decision. And then he says, and just be content. It's, it's a switch you can flip. You can just learn to do it. And Paul says through Hebrews, do it. So we need to take heed when we find ourselves constantly and consistently Looking for the next thing. By the way, that's how, that's how many people just walk out on their spouse. Because they're going to look across the table and say, you are not satisfying me anymore, but I believe there's somebody out there that will. You know, the statistics are astronomical about how when they leave one and have an affair with another and move in with that one, they never stay together. Almost never. You say, why is it? Because once they get there, it doesn't scratch the itch. It doesn't satisfy. And now they've got themselves in a, in a rut of, well, I need to find the one that does. I need to find the one that does. So you end up with the woman at the well. And she says, well, I've had five, and now I've got another one I'm not married to. And she was still unsatisfied. Why do you think the Lord said, well, if you'll drink of the water that I'll give him, he'll never thirst again. You know why he said that? Because he knew in her life she was this. She was continually striving for something to satisfy. And the Lord said, I'm that thing. And so we've got to take heed. The issue here is the covetousness, the intensity. And then last of all in this declaration, there's the interpretation at the end. He says, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You know, it was the Lord that said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more, what did he say? Abundantly. You know the abundant life is not based on your stuff. It's just not. There are Christians all over this country and all over the world, certainly, who are living victorious, happy, effective, content Christian lives with much less stuff than most of us have. So it cannot just be in the stuff. Now, I want to say this to you. Listen very clearly. I am in no way trying to make anybody feel guilty for any of the blessings God has poured in your life. I don't want you to feel, you don't need to feel guilty if you're the richest person in three states. That's not a sin. You ought to tithe maybe real good. That'd be good. But, uh, you know, if God has blessed you, we, we praise the Lord for that. Let me give you a picture. When the Lord took the children of Israel out of the wilderness and he took them into the promised land. Now in the wilderness, he did miracles. Here were the, here were the miracles, some of them. One, he fed them from heaven the same meal every day. Now thank God for his miraculous feeding, but do you want to eat the same meal every day for 40 years? And listen, he miraculously made their clothes last and not wear out. Now that's unbelievable. But ladies, do you want to wear the same dress for 40 years? I mean, I understand the miracle, but you do understand the wilderness was still not the greatest place to spend your life. So another generation comes and he takes them into the promised land. When they go into the promised land, that is all of the past. Now it's milk and honey. 
Now it's, we are wiping out all these nations and we're going in and taking their spoil. We're taking their gold, their silver, their clothes. We're doing all of that. And God begins to bless them with great possessions and great wealth. Now listen to me. I don't believe for a minute, Brother Josh Helton, I don't believe for a minute that God wanted them walking around in, in the promised land feeling guilty about that milk and honey. I don't think he wanted around saying, man, this, our forefathers didn't have all this. I, I feel so bad that we got it so good. No, God didn't want him to do that. He kept saying, I'm taking you over there. I'm going to bless you with the milk and honey. So we're not, I'm not saying that we have to feel guilty if God's been good to us. Oh, no, no. Matter of fact, here's what we got to do. We got to stay humble, realizing that if he has blessed us, it is he that has blessed us. Stay humble. It is God that giveth thee the ability to get gain, the Bible says. It says, what do you have that was not given you? And the answer to that is nothing. So we stay humble and we stay thankful. So we don't have to feel guilty if you've been blessed by the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's the one that did it. He's trusted you with it and you can rejoice in it. But what we have to do is just make sure that we don't ever get to the place that it's never enough. That's the problem is when he's poured it on and poured it on, but you are never satisfied no matter how much you have. At that time, and those thoughts start creeping in, we got to take heed. we got to take heed. We have to learn to be content. How's your, how's your coveting? Now, once again, just like this morning's message, the problem often starts as we begin to look at others' lives. You know, most of our coveting is it because we see somebody else that has stuff that we wish we had? Or we see somebody else that seems to be just getting all the blessings. And then you have thoughts like this, Lord, they don't even... And you start in your mind listing what's wrong with their spirituality. Lord, they don't even this. And Lord, they don't even that. And I try to do this and I try to do that. You know what you better do right there? Take heed, proceed with caution. You're in a dangerous place. We've got to learn to rejoice with those who are being blessed by the Lord. Here it is. And when looking into our own lives, we have to learn to focus on what we do have instead of what we don't have. That's how you deal with this discontentment. You stop looking at everybody else and if something good happens to them, you sincerely can say, praise the Lord. Praise. Now look, sometimes that's tough. You've been praying and praying and praying for a certain thing and then your neighbor pulls it in the driveway. Hey, did you see my new car? They gave it to me at work. Oh, oh, praise the, praise the Lord. I'm so happy for you. I'm about to cry. I'm so happy for you. Well, on the inside you're thinking, oh, Lord, they're the Antichrist over there. They don't love you you got to fight it. we got to learn to rejoice when God is blessing others. And when we look into our own lives, we have to focus on what we do have. We have to strengthen the things which remain, the Bible says. Focus on what we do have instead of what we don't. It's a dangerous thing. Listen, it's a dangerous thing to have thoughts like this. I wish my husband was like her husband. I wish my wife. Now listen, there are a lot of people that wish they had a Christian husband like so-and-so. They think they do. You can't think like that. Boy, I wish my wife was with me in church like she is with him. You better stop that. You know what you're doing? You're coveting another man's or another woman's. And the Lord says, take heed, beware. It's a dangerous thing. So maybe tonight, Brother Matt, you come. I'm going to let you handle this invitation for a minute. And maybe tonight that we can just take this last few minutes and focus on what we do have. So we're going to. We're going to try and sing a song together here. Stand if you would. Brother Matt's going to come and let him have that pulpit mic, Brother Marvin. Let's see if we can find the right key here. As the world looks upon me as I struggle they say I have nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart I'm rejoicing, how I wish they could see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There 
There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. 